जय हिंद दोस्तों मैं हूं मेजर मोहम्मद अली शाह और आज मेरा बहुत बड़ा सौभाग्य है आई एम ट्रूली ऑनर्ड I have a very renowned personality, one of the illustrious admirals of the Indian Navy, the former chief of the naval staff, Admiral Karambir Singh, and who needs no introduction at all. You all know him, and in fact, one of the most admired admirals. I mean, who has a very a nice sense of humour, who's very witty, who's extremely. Of course, you all know. I mean, need not say he's extremely sharp. But now, where does he get all his wit, his sense of humour, and? Uh, the everything all the other qualities from is it his service in the navy or is it that he went to one of the best schools of the country the bomb school in devlali yes i am a gunner and i am wearing my uh, regiment of artillery reunion tie deliberately for this occasion that we forge may there are certain things you have to match so anyway so let i don't want to go on further because uh, admiral kamvi singh needs no introduction but very proudly i would like to say one thing which uh, very few people know that his brother also incidentally is from the same regiment as me it may not be the same immediate regiment magar the regiment of artillery wo bhi bands mein padhe the lekin hum shuruaat karenge shuruaat se guftagu mein sir ke band school ke days i am from a boarding school myself so how was life at the band school a school i have visited many a times sir thank you very much jai hind and thank you for taking your time for us sir thank you ali so kind of you to you know la- uh, you know shah such lavish uh, <laughs> praises of me as just a simple fellow uh, who got a little lucky in the navy um, and definitely one owes uh, everything to you know the the kind of upbringing that you get and the kind of schooling that you get and uh, you mentioned bands uh, certainly bands Uh, was a highlight you know my father was in the air force and uh, we had a very you know, happy childhood a uh, lot of fun and uh, and we traveled along with him my brother myself and uh, my mother and i so we all traveled together wherever he got posted and uh, whether it was uh, you know howdy or delhi or moscow or padodra or Delhi again, and then Devlali. So, Bans is a school that I spent the last three years uh, my schooling, and uh, I really enjoyed every bit of it. Most importantly, we had a lovely uh, environment with uh, in Devlali, a beautiful. Uh, though Wellington is called salubrious, I think Devlali itself is very salubrious. We had a lovely uh, environment to uh, focus, no distractions, and uh, most importantly, I owe everything, uh, whatever. I, Imbibed in bonds to my teachers, amazing set of teachers, extremely dedicated, who made sure that we learned and in a in a happy sort of uh, way, and, uh, and uh, kind courtesy all that, uh, I managed to do pretty fairly okay in uh, uh, the, those days. We had the Indian School Certificate or IAC, and uh, that's how it panned out. that's so heartening to hear sir sir tell us how if you would advocate somebody without some sounding bias about it i am a hardcore believer of a boarding school life for me so i would like to know from admiral karambir singh sir what would you advocate a day schooling or somebody growing up at a boarding school sir uh, frankly you know i i never went to a boarding school my first okay. uh, test with everything was was in in uh, NDA when I actually went away, but uh, both have their pros and cons. I mean, you know, uh, boarding treats you to uh, allows you to gain independence. I mean, be independent in your thinking and uh, in a different way. And uh, parents have their own um, sort of uh, advantage staying with the parents. Uh, of course, the parents have to be both have to have their uh, you know they have their strong points, but both. Uh, have to do their job correctly the parents have to also give you a lot of freedom they 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 help you to bloom they will give you slight course corrections and uh, and that, that's how you uh, you know make or build your character a uh, similar way in the, the boarding if you have a good set of uh, like the house master and uh, the seniors then they give you that kind of grooming so i think both have their advantages disadvantages one cannot uh, sort of 
say that this is better or that is better. Yes, your personality would change uh, based on uh, the kind of experience that you get either through parenthood or through uh, a boarding. Sir, sir. Because normally when I went to visit Barnes, that time we could see the borders. Maybe I could, we, the mind sees what it wants to see. Maybe I could connect a lot with their, I saw their dormitories and such things. So maybe that was the reason. So yeah, your brother... Right. So please. Right. No, my, my so, issue was that we, we were, my, since my father was posted there, so we were day scholars. Uh, yes, you did miss that fun after class that the borders had and the bonhomie that the borders had. But uh, in terms of uh, academics and uh, sports, uh, I really uh, enjoyed everything and I actually flourished uh, in that school. So your brother joined the Gunners. In fact, he joined the Regiment of Artillery. Was it the Devlali influence? The what was it? Do you think it was a Devlali influence, sir, perhaps? I, I think so. I suspect it was. <laughs> so, uh, interestingly, my my father took premature retirement uh, um, and uh, left for the U.S. With, uh, and emigrated to the U.S. And uh, I thought that they were expecting, since I was already in NDA, they were expecting that my brother would uh, go to the U.S. But I think this uh, experience of Barnes and Devlali and uh, seeing me joining the service uh, sort of uh, got, got him into the service. And my parents were very disappointed because then they had to come back because the family was actually split. So they had to come back. So, but how amazing is this, you know, in one house, Army, Navy and Air Force, the father from the Air Force and one, the son, the former chief of the naval staff and son in the army, a very illustrious officer. I mean, I mean, how it can't get better. But did you ever have any uh, kind of a friendly uh, debates or argument about which is better, the army, navy, or air force? <laughs> so we had a lot of friendly banter, which was always there, and um, you know, jokingly we would uh, pull each other's legs. But uh, in heart of heart, we all appreciated that each service. Has their, <laughs> has their strong points and their uniqueness. And uh, I was, I think I'm pretty fortunate uh, in my service career that I had uh, an Air Force grounding. Uh, and then, you know, I'm a flyer. I was served so many years in the Navy. Uh, I also served in the Coast Guard. Uh, as a commander. Chandibi, officer. you commanded Chandibi, sir, in fact. Chandibi. Then I went to staff college as a directing staff. And finally, I was the chief of staff of the Andaman Nicobar Command. And it is then when you realize that uh, each uh, service has its own unique culture. Though the though the you know the heart throbs for the nation, but each each uh, uh, service has a uh, different culture. And that helped me a lot in, in my uh, service, especially when uh, you know when the uh, CDS came up <coughs> and the trice uh, the joints. Uh, the theater commands that we're talking about is being discussed. Uh, I remember going to Australia and asking the then uh, there, even now the present CDF, those days also it was CDF in 2019, and asking what is the most difficult thing uh, uh, for theaterization and jointry. And he said, uh, cultures. So I, I, I felt very lucky. I was very lucky that I had the exposure to all the cultures and I could appreciate what was the reason why or like, like in modern parlance, they say, you know, where this person is coming from. Uh, so, so I, uh, all in all, I think it served me well that our fam my family was uh, tri service, and my career was tri service, and, uh, and I, I, I deeply appreciate the uniqueness of each uh, services culture. Sir, so you have had oh. all experience in flying, in fact, uh, you have. You were you were a helicopter pilot, and so just tell us a bit about your first sortie when you went first time when you actually uh, were flying a helicopter. The first experience, you know, uh, it's interesting. Um, today, uh, I mean, when I finished my flying career, I could land on a tossing and rolling, pitching, yawing deck, but the first sortie that I went on was on a Alouette or Chetak. And uh, my instructor told me, uh, 
if you can keep this helicopter in a hover i give you this entire airfield which is you know you know how big the airfield is huge airfield he said if you can keep this helicopter inside the airfield you uh, are right and uh, you won't believe it i couldn't because uh, you have a collective you have a cyclic you have rudders and it all gets mixed up and then before you know it you are outside the airfield and then you would bring the instructor would bring back the helicopter and then put one finger on top of the uh, cyclic and say look it's so simple so um, it was extremely exasperating and uh, one started doubting one's ability as whether you would be able to control this beast because helicopter is a dynamically unstable uh, aircraft so if it is if it is moved in one direction it will come back and exceed in the other direction so it's it's a, it's a very interesting uh, piece of uh, machinery and to to sort of uh, what do you call it, tame the beast uh, it takes a little bit of practice that was my first experience in helicopter sir so, sir so, so you have flown jeda uh, and also kamovs and so farak hoga sir there must be a big difference i mean it, or is it almost similar that you know agar gaadi chalani aati hai if you can drive a mercedes you can drive uh, a bmw as well but if you it depend of you can drive a, or is, is it as different as driving a car and driving a truck mein or a bus mein farak hai sir driving mein so similarly driving a chetak the way you you have or, i mean sorry flying a chetak or flying a camo is any different sir see the flying skills are already there but the fact is uh, as a as you get into more multi engine and uh, multi role aircraft it becomes more about uh, cockpit management the management of uh, the machinery the management of uh, the armament the man- management of the sensors how you contribute to the overall fleet efficiency so as a pilot you're not only doing you know stick and throttle as they call it but it's a larger uh, ambit that you're covering especially when you're the captain of the aircraft uh, managing uh, the fuel managing your endurances managing tactics uh, in a in a situation where you are in an exercise so uh, chetak was a simpler aircraft it was a utility role aircraft mainly um, there is a camo which i flew next was uh, had a, an asw role <coughs> and and uh, various other roles uh, so, so that is where the difference lies and of course the number of instruments the number of uh, uh, things that you have to monitor also uh, changes but it's a good thing that one builds up gradually from a single engine simple aircraft to a more complicated multi role multi engine aircraft sir sir were you the youngest in your course when you joined nda no no manoj was younger than me Of and, course, of uh, course, of course, of course. Yeah. By the way, by the way, Manoj and I are childhood friends. Um, oh, his, oh, his nice. father and my father were very close friends. Uh, both from the same, uh, you know, he uh, his father came through the NDA. Uh, my father uh, was was a Stephanian and joined uh, as uh, an officer. So both were very close, and so we were very close as uh, kids. and then of course we grew up and uh, luckily we both ended up together at the uh, as chiefs so it, it it carried a long way but i forgotten your question your question was uh, so were you the youngest in the in india one of no, the youngest perhaps well i think manoj was one of the youngest or there were one or two younger boys but i was lucky because uh, those days the senior cambridge used to finish in december so you were already pretty prepared well prepared for your uh, in terms of all the maths physics etc but which uh, nd entrance exam also had and uh, minute you finished i finished my uh, senior came or isc uh, within a fortnight i was in uh, mumbai appearing for the nda so it was a breeze to pass the nda got through the thing and uh, it, uh, it happened very quickly so i was one of the younger guys not the youngest guy this is a this is a Sir, and how was it taking over as the chief of the naval staff? I mean, of course, I mean, you know, it's something. It's a question which a lot of people must have asked you, and uh, you you would be thinking, what am I expected to say? I mean, how would how would one feel when one becomes the chief? It sounds very cliche, but I generally would want to know 
for for an officer, I mean, having having served in the army and also uh, my father was in the army as well. You know, coming from our, our background, when and in when even academy sir, we used to make speculations that oh, so and so is excellent in physicals, so and so is the youngest, so and so is very good in academics, so and so. Uh, we were short service officers. If so and so stays on, so and so would have a very good chance to become a general or perhaps a chief. So we would make a speculation as as young cadets we often do. So. When you became the chief, you were a very famous photograph of yours, which went viral, sir. When you and your mother, in fact, your mother congratulating you, and it was very heartwarming. In fact, everyone was like, "Um, this was something." It really it, today also when I see that photograph, it warms my heart completely, sir. So, how was it when uh, you took over on the reins of the Indian Navy, sir? Uh, you know, a couple of things you said. One was that when we were in NDA, we did not know anything about who's going to become chief or what is going to come next. We were living from day to day, enjoying ourselves, learning, imbibing. NDA taught us teamwork. I remember in the Josh runs, uh, we had if somebody was falling back, you had to pick him up, take him there. It reminded you that, you know, the chain is as strong as the weakest link. And we, we got punished together. We got rewarded together. That was the fun when I mean, we were, what, 16 and a half years old, 16, 17, 18. So there was never this uh, thing about who's going to go where and what. It was just about uh, enjoying ourselves, enjoying the way uh, we were uh, trained, uh, anticipating the, or really keenly anticipating the kind of life that we were going to uh, lead. Uh, so there was never this issue. And uh, I don't know, in my life, I have never, ever looked at my next rank. I was taught very clearly by some uh, wise uh, seniors that just take your job seriously, don't take your, yourself seriously. Second, focus uh, your energies on the job at hand because nowhere in the world will, for instance, a, a young boy of uh, you know early 20s be given command of 40 or 50 uh, people. You know, where, where your, their lives depend on you. When you sail out a ship into the storm, it is, uh, it is these people's lives depend on your professionalism. So that was what, to do your best in whatever was given to you, not to hanker for any other uh, issues, only ask for more responsibilities. Again, I keep quoting my father. My father told me, you're joined a service. You're supposed to serve the nation. The nation is not supposed to serve you. So that is the that is the way we went, and uh, I have uh, never been you know a topper in my course or anything or uh, in any course. I've never been a topper in any course. Only play only course I've topped in is in the golf course. So <laughs> so uh, I never had any uh, great uh, illusions or delusions of where I am. All I wanted to do was to do my best, whatever was in my locus of control. That is the, the men, the material, the machinery, the morale of the, that and the fighting efficiency of uh, the unit. That is the focus and nothing else. And uh, in fact, uh, I, I became the chief because of certain circumstances. I had a very fine officer who, uh, who was senior to me, uh, Admiral Bimal uh, Marma. But for, unfortunately, he could not make a very able, very good officer. I'm, I'm still a very good friend of his. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't become so. I, in a way, superseded him <coughs> to become the chief. Uh, I didn't feel good about it, but uh, once I was given the res responsibility, I think the biggest uh, feeling that comes to you is okay, my God, now you are responsible for something larger than what you have ever been responsible before. And uh, uh, second thing that comes to your mind is that today. Uh, Till now, your focus was within the service. Now, you, since you become the head of the service, your focus has to be to all other, how you interface with all other institutions in the maritime space. So <laughs> I think that was my uh, uh, predominant uh, thought that was in my mind when uh, this particular uh, announcement came. Of course, I hugged my mother because she's given me her entire life. Uh, she looked after us. and. Uh, one has to be grateful. Unfortunately, my father was no more. Uh, of course, he would have jokingly said, uh, whenever I used to get promoted, he would say, 
like right you know from those days we even promotion from major to colonel lieutenant colonel lieutenant commander to commander it was not easy so every time i had get promoted he says i am surprised that the navy is promoting you you've been <laughs> you've been able to pull wool over so many people right <laughs> so i'm sure he would have said that <laughs> had he seen me <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, I mentioned this in the beginning only. You have a very your sense of humor is I don't know the words by excellent. It's of it's it's really amazing, sir. It's really amazing. But also that, that so tell me one thing, you becoming an aviator in the Navy, is it the Air Force influence or is it that something which you really want to do and why did you opt for the Air Force? Yeah, actually, it's a um, you know I'm an Air Force officer's son. I remember we were staying in Dhallakwa, and uh, our neighbor was a Canberra pilot. And seventy-one war was going on those days, and you know blackouts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uncle, as we used to call him, Savan Uncle, he he was he had gone to an undisclosed dis- destination. But uh, his son was a good friend of mine, and we would go into his house and. Uh, he had a spare set of a spare helmet with all you know the bondo we call it with the oxygen mask etc etc so we used to wear that and uh, i still can when I, as i tell you i can still smell that rubber of the oxygen uh, mask and then we would act as if we are flying etc so the sort of love was flying uh, but uh, when i went to for my nda uh, entrance exam i went to mumbai those days bombay and uh, i always loved water i was a very good swimmer and when i looked at the sea it was like an overwhelming feeling that yes the sea is calling me and you know i want to join the uh, the navy and uh, so i went back and you know i had a chat with my dad i said i'm going to give navy as my first choice he said okay you have naval aviation join naval aviation that that shouldn't uh, cause a problem to you and thereafter i was lucky i got navy those days navy was the most sought after service when we were young but um, and then thereafter i joined aviation and in aviation i purposely selected uh, helicopters because that is the machine that operates from sea most of the time all the time so you don't have much time ashore if you join a maritime reconnaissance squadron it is always from ashore if you join fighters it's only from the aircraft carrier so here it gave me the opportunity to to deploy from all types of ships get posted to every type of ship whether it was a survey ship whether it was a destroyer a frigate so i got this opportunity so that's how this whole thing worked out and i became a naval aviator sir so, so you commanded a coast guard ship the chan bb and you know my only association with coast guard has been when i was at ota we had the coast guard right across the boundary wall yes sir between coast us and the and of course, when I led the Assam Rifles marching contingent on Kartavya Path, that time Rajpath in 2008, we had the Coast Guard marching contingent right behind us <laughs> as part of the paramilitary contingent, sir. So, how was it commanding Chand Bibi, sir? I mean, how was the experience there, sir? Uh, Chand Bibi was, uh, was my first command of a ship. So I knew the theory, I knew how to, you know, get a ship alongside and, you know, run a ship. Runnership meaning run it as an officer of the watch, but uh, command of a ship is something else. And uh, uh, hats off to the Coast Guard, they're doing a fantastic job. In those days, when I took command, it was in '89. Uh, it was a, it was almost a, not a fledgling service, but it was still coming up. And uh, um, they would, they had, uh, didn't have the kind of facilities that the Navy had at that time. They leaned uh, very heavily on the Navy, but they had certain very good uh, uh, procedures, systems, practices, which once I finished, I plowed back. I tried to plow back into the Navy. Um, my experience was fantastic. Uh, Coast Guard ships, I was a very small ship, just a crew of 40, um, small little, it's called the insure, insure patrol vessels, but insure is just a misnomer. You're sailing the you know, expanses of the sea. And most of the time you're doing that uh, when you post a storm, when you're looking for fishermen who couldn't make it back. Those days, our communication system wasn't that good. 
today on satellite uh, phones you can inform the fishermen there are methods of informing people to the, and people come back before the storm hits and even the uh, ability to uh, figure out where the storm is going to head is much better those days it wasn't that good so we would rescue people we found standard fishermen out at sea we just looking for a little bit of water and some rice or some food and uh, you know we pick them up sometimes they were they were floating uh, holding on to wooden pieces so i felt uh, a great uh, you know sense of honor that i'm doing something good saving people uh, that was one second of course uh, saving habitat you you must have heard of the olive ridley turtle so we had this um, they come all the way from mexico to hatch in uh, those days they used to come to a beach even now they come to a beach called gahir mata near the wheeler island and uh, protecting these turtles would, would come all the way there just to lay their eggs and then the new, newly hatched uh, turtles would get into the water and swim back so that gave me also a sense that i'm trying to do something for uh, the you know the nature and wildlife so it was a great experience uh, a lot of other things i mean it will take ages for me to tell you but a lot of other things one learned along the way and uh, and vibed and also transfused some of the naval best practices onto the coast guard so i think this system of coast guard navy exchange must continue so so very well said by you sir and sir i love your humility and how modest you are sir and how you uh, actually uh, say that you got lucky i mean it's all kismas it's all destiny it's all written uh, for everyone pehle se likha hua hai that you know that is going to happen sir and uh, one more thing that uh, i just comes to my mind right now so you had a flight from goa just now and i really appreciate your time and and uh, and you and you giving me your time so i would like to know as an aviator normally as drivers people tend to back seat driving do aviators also experience such a phenomena that when they are flying in when they landing when they do i know chopper flying is very different to a fixed living flying in the, but still kuch back street driving or back seat flying hoti hai sir i mean aajkal the things are so automated that uh, i think an aircraft always lands on its own on its own it's only when the weather is really bad and conditions are really uh, difficult uh, that is when the pilot skill comes in today's uh, flying uh, commercial flying is uh, relatively i'm i'm not uh, saying that it's uh, absolutely a piece of cake but it is very automated and uh, landings are simple and uh, there but yes when the weather gets bad and especially when i was flying uh, uh, as a passenger in avros the old hs748 of the air force that is the time yes you would wonder whether how the pilot is landing whether he is doing a good job and when he lands whether he is landing <coughs> the good quality of the landing you could make out uh, but uh, all in all we've got a very professional bunch of uh, pilots both in the armed forces and in civil aviation and uh, you see the track record of civil aviation in terms of, so I, i don't think there's much concern as far as uh, uh, we're not doing backseat driving for them we we'll just sit back and enjoy the flight so Sir, and uh, one more thing, pertaining to golf, sir. You know, you are an avid golfer, and when was the first time that you picked up golf, or you went? Do you remember that, sir? And you felt like you want to play the sport because that's one sport which I have always been encouraged by my father, who's an avid golfer himself, and by uh, my seniors. They say that you can, golf is a, is a sport you can play all your life. You cannot have to. You will not have to give up on it. Unlike football or basketball, yeah. the the sports I would play in school or in academy, sir. and yeah. also sir interestingly i was in conversation with general jj singh and he was mentioning that you know i made one thing very clear that my wife would learn golf because then golf widows have a tough time there after when their husbands out at the golf course all the time and this the same thing my father also did the same thing my mother picked up golf for my father's sake and uh, they play golf together now so how was your experience on the golf course the first time and your journey as a golfer till now sir <laughs> yeah, you know uh, first of all a very important uh, the real sport that one must uh, engage in as a youngster is uh, troop games especially in the armed forces because 
uh, golf is it's got tremendous uh, strong points which we'll come to but uh, it is more of an individual sport it's playing you know with your mind and it helps it helps build different uh, set of uh, personality traits but um, you know, the very important thing that I, I i feel at least in the navy army is pretty good at it in the navy that is declining is the focus on <clears throat> uh, troop games that means playing with the men playing with your troops teaches you to first of all to break barriers ability to talk to each other the ability to uh, uh, play as a team so there are several advantages uh, and of course to physically build your body uh, so that it, it doesn't uh, become uh, start getting you don't start getting back aches when you start playing golf so you need to have a robust physical structure plus you build certain capacities as you as you play through games uh, my, uh, um, uh, you know, in, in the Navy, our view was that uh, initially when we were young, we were all, we wanted to play squash, we wanted to play tennis, uh, these games, we felt that uh, golf was uh, for social climbers. So that was our initial, uh, you know, how we were brought up in the Navy. But uh, once I, uh, my father was always keen, he said, you must pick up golf, it's a special game, there's a, there are a lot of advantages. And uh, you'll really enjoy it. And of course, one of the advantages he told me is that you can play it till so you get into the grave. Uh, but he that was a good, good thing he did for me. But the bad thing he did for me was that I, I am a left-hander. And he gave me his old right-hand set. And he told me that, you know, left hand is the guiding arm. So you play and you play very well. And I struggled with that set for uh, almost a decade, uh, you know, struggling. So I could never hit a, a long ball, but a short game was very good. So <laughs> only after 10 years, I said, no, this is too much. I mean, I can't be that bad. And I shifted, bought myself uh, left-handed clubs. And of course, the game quality went up. Uh, still uh, not uh, what I wanted to be. Uh, because uh, you know, what happens is uh, for golf, you require to practice and persistence is required, which sometimes uh, of our job we could not give. But yes, uh, all said and done, uh, the journey of golf has been really nice. Uh, we made good friends, spent good times, and the, the, low, the whole atmosphere in a golf course is so beautiful. It's green, it's lovely. You appreciate, uh, you know, teeing off almost in the dark in winters, and then sweating uh, like crazy in the summers. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, <clears throat> I've always remembered, uh, and like most golfers, uh, remembered the good holes and forgotten the bad holes, uh, because golf has this knack of inviting you back again. Uh, so that's been my experience with golf. Uh, yes, uh, I have been guilty that last one year I, I haven't uh, played golf. Because I have fallen in love again with my first love, and that is the sea. I follow Admiral Arun Prakash, who is my hero, a hero for all of us. At the age of 79, he cycles down to the beach, Bukmala Beach, and swims in the sea three days a week, and four days a week he plays golf. I decided that seven days a week I'll swim in the sea. I'll also cycle down to the beach and swim in the sea. So that is now, presently for one year, that has been my intoxication. Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. I mean, you mentioned about Arun, Arun Prakash, sir. With him, again, I would, uh, his sense of humor and yours, I would say it's very similar. I was in a similar conversation with, with him, sir. Very witty, sir. Very witty. So that makes me, as a youngster, form a perception that all naval chiefs have a very good sense of humor, sir. <laughs> <laughs> sir, thank you very much for your time, sir. And uh, before we part, for the day, sir, any last message you would like to give to our youngsters who aspire to join the Defence Forces, the Army, Navy, Air Force, who better than a person who comes from a tri service family, who would, and who's been the chief of the Naval Staff, who can advise the youngsters, who would the youngsters would listen to very intently? No, I've, I've, you know, you ask an old man for advice, you'll get two hours of advice. But I'm trying but to distill. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I think one very important uh, piece of advice is that our institution uh, of the armed forces has been built uh, over decades of of uh, you know of hard work, sincerity um, of our predecessors, and uh, what I feel is that we must protect what is good. Not that we become status quo, but we must protect what is good. And uh, some of the things that are good is the fact that we should be apolitical, completely apolitical. Uh, we should <clears throat> not lose our principles uh, for, uh, you know, personal uh, advancement or a personal ambition. Uh, this is something which I really felt uh, is lacking in our senior leadership that uh, sometimes the principles are given a buy just to get uh, for your personal and there'll always be a carrot uh, you just have to say no to the carrot your carrot should lie with your the, the people that you are serving with the army navy or air force or the armed forces they are the carrot one smile from a sailor or a jawan or an airman should make your day rather than you know looking upwards and trying to please people. You've got a very, very difficult job at hand. You've got a pacing threat in China. You've got a very difficult neighborhood. And our focus should be on making our service combat ready and combat ready in the fullest sense, not, uh, not, a, not a Potemkin uh, military. Uh, cohesive in terms of getting everybody well knit. Uh, we should be, we should be future ready. We should be able to think ahead, and that is where our uh, officers and future leaders must focus their time and effort, <clears throat> rather than focusing their time and effort on issues such as you know personal advancement and things like that. This I think is the biggest scourge uh, that uh, our uh, services, uh, I mean the danger that our services uh, can get into, and if you have a personal ambition. I have a personal ambition to do your job well. The job is tremendous. The responsibility is tremendous. Even as a young platoon commander or when you're sitting uh, in the LAC or LOC, that responsibility is tremendous. People are sleeping well at night because you're doing your job well. That is where the focus should be and not on looking over your shoulder as what my boss is thinking. And things like that. I think if we can get back to that, uh, we will maintain our... Uh, credibility as the armed forces. Sorry for giving you such a long uh, sermon on the mount, but this is something I feel very strongly about. Thank you. Not at all, sir. Long sir. We, I, we learned so much. We loved hearing you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. And very sound advice, very sage advice you've given us. Sir, thank you so much for your time, sir. Truly grateful to you. And uh, Jai Hind, sir. Jai Hind Ali and uh, keep smiling. Thank you so much. For making Thanks. me feel so comfortable. This is the most comfortable interview that I have ever had. <laughs> wow, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Means so much. Means a lot to me, sir. Thank you very much, sir. End the talk.